brief introduction on oh, today I will give a brief um, you know share some of our experiences on binding geospatial education through one of the initiatives we have been doing uh, in uh, uh, establishing open source geospatial labs in universities uh, worldwide so this is uh, in fact this map is uh, four months uh, old and I was just uh, trying to update it but you know we have now around 40 labs but the whole idea is, you know, we have been uh, uh, from a very uh, humble beginnings. We started adding more and more universities, uh, establishing more and more labs and universities worldwide. So, what is our key aim and key mission? Uh, and the key key mission for uh, all of us in the EDU community is to make geospatial education accessible to all. And that's how we started on this kind of uh, uh, theme of why we need to make sure more universities uh, and you know, education institutes can start GIS programs. And if you think about it, you know, how many universities in, for example, developing countries, you know, run uh, GIS courses now? Very few actually, but, you know, what, but in, that's going to change, you know, and, and thanks to, you know, the huge community, OSU community, you know, and a lot of open source GIS software, you know, we are now in a position to make sure a lot more universities can start teaching GIS and, uh, Making available, uh, you know, more educational resources. So, so uh, we will share some of those uh, things as well. So, again, you know, the, one of the key questions uh, as educators, you know, we need to ask is why? You know, why are we? Why we? Why, why do you want to? You know, use open source uh, uh, geospatial software or you know, open source in general for education? And I think it's it's primarily, you know, it's a social responsibility. You know, if you think about it, you know, when you make resources, you know, available including software and data openly, you know, it, it dramatically increases the opportunities for knowledge to be shared widely. And, you know, it increases uh, learning opportunities for everybody worldwide. So that is kind of the fundamental principle of, you know, why we, for education, you know, it's very, very important we uh, focus on uh, making resources available uh, uh, worldwide. And even in the OST community, there are lots of Good examples. Uh, for example, the GVC uh, community. Is anybody from GVC here? GVC community. Okay. Yeah. But you know, GVC community. For those of you who don't know, uh, they are mostly based in uh, Spain, but they have been doing fantastic work on their GVC uh, 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 software. But more importantly, in the education uh, area, they have something called GVC Batovi program, which is in Uruguay, and. Uh, it's amazing how uh, they have been able to, and Uruguay, for those of you who don't know, it's a developing country in uh, South America, and they have been using, uh, re but they have been re really progressing in the education front by developing a lot of innovative tools, uh, mostly built on what, what was what was known as the Plan C ball initiative, where they started uh, for all schools uh, across the country, all students, you know, they were able to provide uh, uh, IT uh, education and uh, GVC Batovi specifically looks at how you can use uh, like uh, geographic information for teaching students in schools and this is a very big success and I was very very impressed and one of the key people working in that is uh, Sergio Lagasta from uh, the uh, one of the government ministries there and you know I was very very impressed and one of the things we are now doing is trying to translate there are a lot of uh, document because most of them are in Spanish uh, one of the things now uh, we are doing is trying to get it s translated into English so that you know other countries uh, you know teachers in other countries also can start you know reusing it and uh, think about ideas for making more uh, more uh, making it more available and universities, you know, for example, my university here, you know, we have a uh, very strong focus on uh, open education resources, and we have a, a central program which is, you know, uh, supported by the very uh, highest level in the university called Open Nottingham. And the whole uh, mission of Open Nottingham is, you know, we want to make sure there is uh, it's knowledge without borders, and it's not just, uh, you know, geography or any other disciplines. It's, you know, it's colleagues uh, from all different disciplines, you know, contributing their uh, learning materials in OER or in open education resources so that it is made available in a wider, uh, to the wider community. And this is happening in universities, uh, you know, I just gave you one example from this university, but you know, there are lots of other initiatives happening in other universities as well. And I, I think that uh, that adds lots of momentum of for the next, uh, you know, one year, two year time, the timeline when we have more and more uh, uh, education resources being made available as well. 
So just coming to uh, give you some basic idea of, you know, uh, some basic background of the initiative. So this initiative was jointly uh, done by the ICA and the OSGO. So ICA, for those of you who don't know, is, a, is, the, uh, is more, mostly a scientific organization. It was founded in uh, more than 50 years back in Switzerland. And it, it has member nations across the world. Uh, and it is the world authority body for cartography and geographic information science. And it has a very it's a research driven uh, uh, scientific organization. And uh, it has a, uh, most of this research is uh, driven by 28 commissions. So they drive all the research. So it is, you know, you have uh, specific commissions on uh, from, uh, you know, uh, specific areas in GI science to like automated generalization to uh, cartographic, uh, theoretical cartography to usability. So there's it's a very, very broad range of uh, different uh, specific specialities being represented. And uh, uh, and it's mostly, you know, the key mission is to get high quality publications as well as, you know, gather the uh, academic and research community together. So, and education and training is one of the key uh, missions of uh, the ICA, and uh, uh, that's uh, the, the, that was the background for the ICA's uh, stuff. And I actually chair the commission on open source geospatial technologies for the ICA as well. And again, we you what we are. We are, you know, we are a very uh, young community compared to ICA. We are only seven years old, but again, we are a very high impact community. And I was just looking at about just about 2008 stats and you know you can see all these projects have huge uh, huge uh, number of uh, collaborators behind it and uh, the key thing is uh, f in even from the OSG mission we are we we are look, uh, OSG is uh, the whole mission is to support the collaborative development of open source software and also it promotes its uh, widespread use and education is uh, key to our mission so you know it just uh, you know once we brought together uh, the geospatial community as well as the education community in ICA, that had a very, very big uh, change. And so just two years back, uh, uh, September 2011, um, uh, ICA and OSGO signed an MOU for uh, collaborating. And that time, you know, it was, we, we had a vision of what we wanted to do because we knew, you know, there is very, uh, we, we have to make sure there is a lot of uh, universities and a lot of more people get access to geospatial education. And that time, you know, it, uh, it, it was uh, Professor George Garner from the IC, uh, IC and Arnold from OSGO, was the OSGO president that time who signed the MOU. And the whole vision that time was, you know, we still worked uh, together to uh, create more opportunities for uh, geospatial, uh, open source geospatial training uh, in not just universities, but uh, industry, government, everything and get that community going. And what we were thinking was uh, to establish five labs in uh, five years' time. So because, you know, that time we have, we, were, we, was, we didn't have even have an idea of how, how much interest it is or how much, uh, how we are going to uh, explore it further. But that was our initial aim. So we wanted to establish five labs and also, uh, you know, uh, develop, because one of the key things we found was a lot of uh, educators, even though they were interested in teaching uh, uh, GIS, they didn't have uh, training materials, uh, proper training materials. So we wanted to set up, uh, you know, repositories as well as platforms for uh, open education resources as well. And obviously we had interest in uh, the publications uh, of the, because of, uh, for the scientific community it's very important. We have publication routes. And for example, this Phosphogy conference, thanks to Baron Coburn from ITC and uh, Franz Joseph uh, from Stuttgart University, you know, we have a, uh, uh, the one of the academic, the academic one uh, track of the academic track, uh, you know, we have uh, publications in transactions in GIS, you know, being published uh, in the next month or some. So, so it's so that way we have we wanted to make sure all Phosphogy conferences have a strong publication track record also. So those those were the kind of ideas behind that MOU when we started. So we had three key aims uh, when we started on this education initiative. One was we want to start establish uh, research and training opportunities in open source GIS. And second one was to build a teaching and research infrastructure worldwide. And the third one was to provide worldwide uh, learning platforms. So these were the uh, key kind of main things we have been working on for the last uh, two years. So just a brief, brief summary, in the just two years, you know, we have established over 40 labs in uh, two years. And the big, country-wise, our biggest growth is in USA, six labs now. But 
uh, region wise you know europe is has been the biggest growth we have uh, around 14 labs now in europe but we are hopefully as the word uh, goes around and you know mostly you know when colleagues tell other colleagues in other universities then they come to uh, email us and then that's how we have been uh, able to uh, gather momentum for building more and more uh, research and teaching laboratories across the world. So our aim is next year this time we shall have over 100 laboratories established in universities across the world and we are on target you know because every year even this uh, this conference we have at least 10 new universities approaching us so it's 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 just that momentum keeping building up uh, and we are now represented in all main all the continents as well. So for educators, you know, I just wanted to pause back and just, you know, reflect on why, you know, why should universities think about, you know, why should there be a framework for or a strategy for open source education and why is it important for the future? And when you think about it, you know, all different levels, I was thinking, you know, there is very, very big uh, uh, reason why we universities should invest in uh, open source education and from the top level, from the strategic level to the research level to teaching level. And again, attracting research funding, again, a big uh, area for universities, you know, so again, that is, uh, uh, that again, uh, the open uh, research and open uh, education is very important uh, factor. And sustainability, and if you look at research, you know, most projects, they uh, finish with a timeline, but if you have a, a project which is built on open source uh, uh, principles, you know, the project will live on even after the project funding ends. So, and uh, now, uh, funding organizations are very, very uh, strict that they need to make sure that the projects are sustained for a long time. So that is again good news for, uh, for the open source uh, community. And for me personally, and for all of the colleagues, it's again you know there is a big social responsibility why we need to make sure you know uh, education is made accessible to all. So in you know, there are lots and lots of examples, but you know the main thing is openness, increase innovation, and. Does anybody know the importance of 30th April 1993? Anybody here? Well, that was the date when uh, the, the whole internet, the CERN released the internet for the whole world. And that was a very important uh, uh, date for the whole humanity because, you know, w whatever we are doing now is thanks to that whole vision of openness in innovation. And that's the whole thing, what we want to do sh to, to make sure that happens in the geospatial education as well. So now looking at, uh, you know, I'll just give you some examples, mostly UK example, but you know, if you look at other, uh, other, other governments as well, it is the same. You know, it's happening from the very top level. In UK, for example, in just uh, in like three years back, January 2010, the U UK government had the open source, open standards, reuse government action plan. And this was, uh, the, that time government uh, decided to think, you know, why, you know, why we have to make sure our resources are used properly. And they came up with this action plan and you know now you know it is implemented and it's it, it's a, a mandatory kind of you know so the open agenda is implemented and is delivering huge uh, savings for the uk government uh, just you know from numbers uh, it's around 409 million in the first half of this year and this is going to increase over over the uh, uh, over the future so this is a big uh, big uh, momentum for the governments to make sure they they, they also uh, can cap, uh, can make use of uh, open source in, uh, in not only uh, increasing um, reducing uh, cost and increasing savings but also increasing innovations uh, innovation and efficiency and again you know lots of uh, things happening in uh, the europe for example the eu digital agenda again a big uh, good news for open data uh, things as well. So all the open data projects is this. It's been driven by the uh, from the very strategic level, and it's global as well. It's not just one country or one region. You know, it's happening across the world. And just one example of open government from US. So the message is very clear. You know, it is uh, from a strategic point of view. It's 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 happening. It's happening in a much much, and that is good news for open source uh, geospatial education because that means you know there is more investment coming for universities to start uh, doing teaching and research. And again, one of the uh, important things for me is, you know, is if you, when you, uh, you know, when you think about science, and I just uh, was looking at the science, and science is the ability for showing the operation of general laws, and it is very, very fundamental for scientific research. And what, uh, you know, open source, open standards, and open data allows uh, education is it for, for the first time, we can actually make sure we can develop curriculum based on it so that it is truly, the students have an ability to learn and build upon a lot of things uh, which, which they can make sure it is truly open and they can uh, 
may, uh, they can understand and uh, build strong foundations on a board. And you know, this is possible because of many, many. It's not just the OSGO community. It, is, it became possible because of a lot of things happening at the same time. You know, the uh, developments in geospatial standards, especially the OGC ones and o the open data initiatives from governments as well as from uh, top level as well as from. Uh, like uh, crowdsource ones like OpenStreetMap and obviously the maturity of open source software as well. And for us, uh, the, you know, what we started doing was to make sure uh, the first team was to establish open source GIS teaching and research. And we started with, uh, you know, workshops, uh, uh, events and things like that to st get more people start uh, learning GIS. Uh, because most of our new users, they haven't even used open source GIS. So it is just uh, giving, them, giving them a taste to, so that they, they are aware of it and then they can learn uh, on their own later. And, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, colleagues, uh, from other universities, we have been able to you know, start some good initiatives. And one good example is uh, the Open Source Summer School that City in Girona have been doing for the last four years, actually. And they have been very, very successful. This is targeted at a PhD students. So it's a five-day program and uh, very intensive. And students come from all these different backgrounds. And the whole idea is you know, they, they are all trained in open source uh, Open, open source GIS uh, in those four, in those uh, short time, but you know they, they get a strong foundation, and we can see it being replicated by uh, you know other regions, you know maybe in USA, uh, you know in Australia, other countries. They can, they have they have also this opportunity to start you know specific training programs focused on uh, on short time uh, for PhD students and master students, etc. So that is one part of our training kind of activities, and the other. Part is the strategic training programs, so, you know, kind of like train the trainer programs, and this is again very important for us. And uh, this was uh, especially led by uh, Baron Corbin from ITC. He has been uh, very successful in developing like uh, short courses, and this was one example where he had a short course uh, run a short course, especially for UN staff in Vienna last. Uh, in 2012 November, and it was very successful. And the whole idea was because United Nations, you know, it's uh, very global. They have offices all around the world. And once you teach uh, staff there, you know, they will be able to teach their colleagues and things like that. So this is again one area we want to make sure we again start uh, uh, having more collaborations uh, to for the future. And the third aim, uh, the second aim was to build research infrastructure. And this is one example. I uh, just give uh, give the example from University of Nottingham, where we. When we set up the lab here, we brought together people from not just University of Nottingham, uh, but from OSGU Foundation, uh, from uh, from the industry, from various government organizations, Ordnance Survey, BGS, and the whole idea was to make sure we start uh, uh, developing those uh, collaborations for the future as well. And now I'm just going to quickly give a flavor of what is happening in our labs worldwide. So this is from the University of Pretoria, and they have been, uh, Pretoria in South Africa, they have been one of the uh, most uh, uh, successful, you know, they have been doing a lot of training programs, uh, running undergraduate master's programs, and they have been using, uh, for, for them, once they set up the lab, they are, they are now pushing it in a much, much uh, faster way, uh, and hopefully, I'm hoping more universities in Africa start, uh, start will be, they, they'll be able to help other universities in Africa also s uh, set up their labs. And just, just a couple of other examples. This is, uh, uh, Thanks to Anne, she just uh, sent the information to our OSGO announce and website. So we, this is our newest lab in uh, ETH Zurich. So you know, every time you know we are uh, establishing labs and ETH Zurich, is there, they have very strong focus on cartography. So we are uh, building uh, labs. This is our second lab in Zurich. And this is just two weeks back, uh, University of North Carolina, they established the lab. They have very strong focus on uh, high-end computing, uh, 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 big data, uh, or so much computer. There are more computer science-based uh, department. Again, they have been so. It's just giving a flavor of what is happening across the world. And another university in USA, North Carolina State. This was um, led by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Helena Mitasova, and she has been a key part of our initiative. She has been uh, working to uh, on the research as well as education part of it. She has been doing a lot of work to promote uh, open source geospatial in education. And uh, uh, so there are so much. So you, know, you can visit the, each of their individual websites and get an idea of what these uh, universities are doing. 
and example from Italy, it's the uh, laboratory, uh, the, but unfortunately Maria couldn't come to here today, but they have been again doing a lot of, not just research teaching, but also, you know, some, some examples I would like to give is like, they ran a very successful NASA World Bank Europa Challenge last year, and I was one of the jury members, and I was impressed by the quality of submissions of these students who, you know, in just short time were able to do, and we hope to, it will continue for the future as well, but, but you know, uh, so each of these labs, they have been not just uh, doing their own teaching and research, but they have been, you know, doing so much big, bigger initiatives which, which uh, you know, benefits the uh, wider uh, community as well. And an example from Brazil, this is the University of Parana. We established the, the lab in Brazil last year, and, they, and with, within uh, just uh, two, three months, you know, uh, uh, they started uh, organizing workshops, and, you know, uh, they, they had this first workshop last uh, June, and they had more than 10 labs now interested to join our network and start uh, establishing more labs in Brazil. And example from uh, University of Pretoria, when they started, you know, they have been using for their undergraduate BSc Geoinformatics and postgraduate courses, and also for continued education programs. And they are running short programs for QGIS, post-GIS, uh, as well as they have been collaborating with other universities. For example, this example is from ITC uh, in Netherlands, and they have been collaborating with Polytechnic of Namibia for running short-term courses for alumni. And in UK, again, lots of examples, this University of Southampton, you know, they have a very big uh, group uh, there uh, uh, who are very strong GIS, uh, geography as well as, but they have brought together colleagues from computer science, engineering, geography, archaeology, and they have very strong uh, research in key areas of open data, semantic birth, uh, transport, health, and they have lots of research projects that which have been running over a long period, so they have very, very strong uh, research uh, aspects as well, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but you know, just giving you a flavor of what kind of research each of these labs have been doing. And, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so I'll just quickly, uh, the University of uh, Newcastle, our lab, and uh, the, all these labs in Warwick, you know, they are all in different schools and things like that, and this is an example from Malaysia where they have set up the lab, uh, and uh, now they are helping other universities in Malaysia setting up the labs. And again, one example from, this is the last example really from University of Melbourne, and they had a, one thing I liked about them is they had one focus on the smart cities, and they brought together colleagues from all these different departments and set up a very interesting group there to set up the OSGO lab, and they have a lot of research projects actually building on top of open source, especially one of the projects they are already doing called ORIN, and a lot of research actually going here. And the last aim was to set up a global uh, training platform, and we have developed uh, that one as well. And this is what uh, the Eulogio repository, so anybody can go and uh, look, uh, search for uh, learning materials, and there are a lot of learning materials for updating it, and uh, lots more will be added to in the future. So final, uh, what are our next steps? Uh, you know, we are working to establish over 100 research labs in university across the world by September 2014, and we want to expand this to build capacity uh, training programs for train the trainer programs and uh, for, uh, for, for uh, educators worldwide. And we also want to collaborate with and provide support for educational programs like GVSIC, Batovi to help train school teachers and GIS. And we have our uh, website, we are working on a new website, so all the information on all our current labs, their URLs are all there in the website, so uh, you know, feel free to go and uh, look at them, and if you, uh, if you are uh, you know, is, uh, interested to join, just uh, email us. And finally, thank you to all the members of the ICA OSJ Labs Network who actually made this possible, and thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. That was a very enthusiastic story. Uh, any questions for Suchit? Yep. So just a question about how these um, new labs, A, are funded, and then B, how they operate. Are there opportunities for, say, PhD students to go and do an exchange in, say, Uruguay and uh, share knowledge and then come back? Oh, okay. is, is there an exchange program? Yes, well. The question is, uh, I, I just. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, repeat the first one was, uh, you know, is there any pro uh, uh, opportunities for exchange program? So in that question, for example, uh, for, for example, the one example I can give you is because uh, we, what we do is universities, you know, we uh, apply for bids for different research projects. So we have a very active uh, monthly meetings where we, one of our agendas is, you know, what bids can we apply for. And currently our focus is on, we are putting a cost bid, which is, uh, for those of you in Europe will know, cost is like a network bid, uh, which will help uh, academics as well as researchers uh, use that funding for doing meetings and things like that. So. Uh, we apply for those kind of bits, and one of the key uh, things we are, oh, 
And one of the key uh, funding mechanism for us is, it depends on the country, but looking for like uh, Horizon 2020, that's one big area we want to set up a good network and it is international funding as well. So once we know who are the key people who have the expertise, we can start preparing bits so that you know we can then leverage depending on the funding call. For example, if it's a transport funding call, we know we have colleagues in Australia who have very strong uh, transport research. We, we have colleagues in uh, South Amden. Right? And so that way we can build strong consortiums. And also uh, another thing is uh, uh, for faculty, you know, we have like visiting, uh, for example, one of the colleagues from Brazil, I don't know if she's here now, she's from the University of Parana, but she's now a, a one year visiting uh, researcher here at University of Nottingham. But she was, she applied for funding through the Brazil, Brazilian funding agency. And then, you know, then we were able to uh, support her, uh, bring her here so that she can study what is going on here and then go back and then, you know, bring the labs there. Okay, yeah. thank you, Sushit. I think we're running out of time. Uh, you had another question, but maybe you can ask uh, yep. later on. Thank you very much. I think we have to swap and.